The world's so sinful and it's going to be God's judgment upon sin. Everybody in the world is going to drown in this flood. And he got a permit to build a monstrous old boat out there, 450 feet long. He says he's going to put animals in it and people in it in order to preserve life so that there be life on the other side of the flood. Can you imagine a cotton bull story like that? That old boy is really goofy, isn't he? And the newspaper reporter began to smell the story. You mean to tell me, man, that he said the whole world's going to be covered up with the flood? That's what he said. The whole world is going to be covered up with the flood. Oh, when's this flood coming? He didn't say when it's coming, but he tried to get me to come and get in his boat. I told him I wouldn't talk about religion. And he says, everybody in the world's going to drown? That's what he said. Everybody in the world's going to drown. Thank you, man. I've got to get this story. Ran back out, jumped in his car, and out toward Noah's place he went, just fast as he could go. <laughs> Ah, slammed on the brake. Here Ham and Shem and Japheth and Noah out there working already. He went out there. I'm a reporter from the Euphrates Valley Morning Gazette. I'm looking for Mr. Noah. I'm Mr. Noah. Uh, Mr. Noah, I was just down to City Hall. The city engineer told me that you said there's going to be a great big flood upon this earth. That it's going to cover the whole world up and drown everybody in the world except you're going to build a ship out here and everybody's floating in this ship will survive the flood. And all the animals floating in this ship will survive the flood. Is that right? Did you say that? Well, it isn't exactly right. I'm not the one who said it. It was God who said it. And Mr. Reporter, if God said it, you better believe it. Because when God says it, that's the way it's going to be. Tell you what to do. God promised this flood, and he also promised that anybody in this ark would escape the flood. If you'll come out here and help me, Mr. Reporter, with, with this ark, when the flood comes, I'll have you a little place in there. You won't have a thing to worry about, man. You'll be safe in the hands of God, safe in the ark of God, while everybody else is out there going under. Oh, man, don't have time to talk to you about that now. I've got to get the details of this story now. Now, uh, when did God come to you? The day before yesterday. Uh, what time of the day was it? About 11.30, just since we got through with our church service. Now, exactly what did God say? Well, he didn't say much. He just said that he's tired of the sin of the world, all the ungodliness and unholiness that's here, that judgment is going to come upon this earth in the form of a great flood, that it'll rain 40 days and 40 nights. The fountains of the deep shall open up and add their volumes to that falling from the heavens until every hill and every mountain shall be covered and everything that walks on dry ground and breathes the breath of air for life shall die. And that I'm supposed to build a ship and get my family in it and he's going to send animals to put in there and we're going to survive the flood and it'll be the only ship that will survive the flood and you better think about getting in. Got to get this story in it now. Uh, is that all God said? About all God said. That's about all he told me. Didn't say anything else much. Uh, what did this God look like? You know, for the life of me, I couldn't tell you. Uh, just kind of light and glory. How do you know it's God? Well, I just knew it's God. Couldn't anybody else know things like that or draw blueprints this quick or show me how to do things. I, I just know it was God. I just knew it was God. Mr. Newspaper Reporter, thank you, Mr. Noah, ran back, went up into the office. Newspaper was going. He said, stop the presses, stop the presses. I've got a story. And he told them about Noah's predictions of a flood. And sure enough, the next morning, Headlines in the Euphrates Valley Morning Gazette. World doom. Preacher predicts flood. And then the details, the brief details of what Noah had claimed that some sort of a god had said. Out beyond the city on three hills were the buildings of the University of the Near East. Right off the campus of the University of the Near East, there lived 
an old professor of physics in his little cottage by himself. The next morning, the old professor got up in his pajamas, about half asleep and totally disheveled. And the old <laughs> professor came to his front door. He opened his door to get his morning newspaper and his jug of milk, and he reached down and got the newspaper and the jug of milk, and he looked at that newspaper, and his eyes popped open. And he got all excited. He got so excited, he just dropped that milk. It splattered everywhere, and he didn't even pay any attention to it. And he got to reading. And as he read, he started grinning like a jackass eating briars. <laughs> and he was grinning. And oh, he got all stirred up. And then he ran back in his house. He got his shoes and his hat. In his excitement, he stuck one foot through his hat and put a shoe on his head and finally got a shoe on this foot, ran out, jumped on his bicycle and up to his laboratory he went at the university just pedaling that bicycle as he could. He went in and he worked on his calculator a little while and then he fed some information into his computer and he got that answer back from the computer and he was grinning bigger than ever. And he went back out, got on his bicycle, out toward Noah's place he went just as fast as he could pedal that thing. Went out there Noah and him and Shem and Japheth already working. He went out there. I'm looking for Mr. Noah. I'm Mr. Noah. I'm Professor Know-it-all. I am a professor of physics up at the University of the Near East. Mr. Noah, I have read the morning newspaper in which you say that there's going to come a universal flood upon this earth. That's going to cover every hill and every mountain. That's going to drown everybody in the world and everything that walks on dry ground and breathes the breath of air for life. Mr. Noah, now we men of science have known for ages that the hope of this world is in the educational processes and the increase of the intellectual knowledge of man. That religion is nothing more than the opiate of the people. And Mr. Noah, we put every preacher on earth out of business with our scientific knowledge except you. Now, Mr. Noah, I've got you. What do you think about that? Man, I didn't even know you were after me. I mean, I've got you with some scientific knowledge. Mr. Noah, do you know anything at all about chemistry or physics? Don't know a thing. Do you know anything about the chemical composition of water? Uh, no, only thing I know about water is ham don't like to take a bath in it on Saturday night. <laughs> and when you're really thirsty, best thing in the world to quench your thirst is a cold glass of pure water. I know another thing about some water. There's going to be a lot of it around here one of these days, and you better get ready for it, Mr. Professor, because when God says anything, you better believe God knows what he's talking about and God says it's going to be a flood and that everybody's going to drown in it. You're going to drown in it too, except tell you what to do, Mr. Professor. If you will come out here and help me with this ark, I'll fix you a little place in it. And when the flood comes, you won't have a thing to worry about, man. You'll be safe in the hands of God, safe in the ark of God, while everybody else is out there drowned. Wouldn't you consider? I didn't come out here to get on your ship, Mr. Noah. I came out here to torpedo your ship. Now, let me give you a little basic lesson, a simple lesson in chemistry. Mr. Noah, the chemical formula for water is H2O. That means it's two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen. Now, Mr. Noah, I've run it through my computer. There simply is not enough hydrogen and oxygen in existence to make enough water to create a flood of such magnitude as you say is going to be upon this earth. That is a scientific fact. Now, what do you say about your flood? Well, uh, I don't know much about science, or hydrogen or oxygen or the combination of it, but 
I believe God. I reckon if God needs a little more hydrogen and oxygen, he can get it where he got that first batch. <laughs> oh, that's how always God can do, God can do, God can do. And the old professor went on down through the years. He stood there in his class and he said to the young people, now we men of science know, of course, that scientific discovery holds the hope of happiness for the human race. If our utopian dream ever materializes and becomes a fact, it would be because we men of science have discovered the secrets of this world and utilize them for the happiness and good of humanity. We know, too, that religion is nothing more than a crutch upon which weak people hobble through life. That it is superstition which possesses the minds of men and becomes the opiate of their minds. And a good example of these truths is this old man Noah out here. We know, of course, that is a scientific fact but there isn't enough hydrogen and oxygen in existence to make a flood of such magnitude as he says some god told him shall come upon this earth. And yet he persists in his stubbornness to suppose that this god can get some hydrogen and oxygen from somewhere and add it to what he's got and make a flood like that. And all the kids just soaked it up. This guy's supposed to know what he's talking about. He had a doctor's degree in physics, and he was a professor in the university, and they believed him. And none of them believed old Noah. And the years went on. Fifty years passed. Noah out there working, people passing by making fun. And Noah all the time. He witnessed everybody that came by, not a soul would listen to him. They just laughed at him and make fun, made fun of him. Didn't have a convert in 50 years. 75 years passed. People still going by. Noah's still working on the ark, still getting that gopher wood and putting the thing together and all kinds of people coming by. One day, Noah and Ham and Shem and Japheth out there working away, and they looked up. Here came a bunch of people with placards. Down with the ark. Stop the ark. Quit building the ark. We protest. We want this ark stopped. Noah went out there. Who are you people anyhow? We're environmentalists and ecologists. We protest the building of this ark. You've already killed two rare snakes and four rare lizards. You're going to make the gopher wood tree an extinct species in this world. We want it put in the forest preserve. You stop building this ark. Man, all I'm doing is what God told me to do. Uh, I'll tell you, why don't y'all lay your placards down and find out what God wants you to do in this world. That'll be of some benefit and some good. Why don't you come and help me with this ark? I'll have plenty of room for you folks in it. If you just come and carry the right banner, the banner of God, and when the flood comes, you won't have a thing to worry about. We protest. Stop the ark. And they wouldn't listen to it. They just kept protesting. Years went on. hundred years went by. Not a convert. And all those years. And all kinds of people going out there to see old crazy Noah. One Saturday afternoon, kind of late, a whole pile of teenagers, about 12 or 14 of them, in a long, low convertible, piled up in there, heads and torsos and legs and arms sticking out every direction. They had five in the floor, man. Uh, and they had some straight pipes which would bypass the muffler, and they could really roar down the freeway. And they were talking. What are we going to do tonight, man? This us go too crazy Noah. Cool, man, cool, man. Hit one of them five and let's take off from here. 
That old boy threw that thing in the gear. There <laughs> Noah was. He saw. They stopped looking out there at Noah. Noah started walking over there, and here was a girl, about two thirds out of there, hanging out of there, a pair of polka dot hot pants on, and a cigarette in her mouth. You know, many a man thought he was getting a little deer. He got her home, and her breath smelled like a camel. Noah said, hello, young people. <laughs> hello, daddy-o. <laughs> young folks, the old ark is just about finished. Fact is, we have Sunday school inside the ark now. And tomorrow's Sunday. Why don't you young people come and enroll in our Sunday school tomorrow? And when the flood comes, I'll have a place for you young people in there. You won't have a thing to worry about. You'll be safe in the hands of God. Safe in the ark of God while everybody else is out there drowning. Oh boy, can of beer back there in the back seat. Hey, cool it, Pops. We don't dig this religion bit, man. It just ain't our bag, but we got my can of trunk. A brown bag. Man, it's got a bunch of joints in it. And we got a little angel dust hid back there, too. And we got two cases of beer. We're going out here to this teenage night club. When you out yonder in that old Sunday school in that ark in the morning, we're going to be floating around in a psychedelic world with more colors in it than your old heaven that you talking about. Goodbye, man. They threw that thing in gear. <laughs> Away they went. 120 years passed by. And then Noah stepped back after 120 years. God, there she is, all done, just exactly like you told me to build it. Got the food in there for my family, got the food in there for my animals. God, I'm ready when you're ready. And old Noah and his family marched up the ramp, went into the ark. Next morning, in a high-rise apartment, down on the edge of the city where Noah's ark was built, a woman woke up on the second floor of that high-rise and rubbed her eyes looked at the window, <laughs> and her husband jumped. What's the matter with you? I saw a giraffe go right by that window. A giraffe. I told you not to drink all that stuff last night. Pink elephants and now giraffes. Whoop, there is a giraffe. And they ran over there and looked, and sure enough, two big old giraffes heading out toward Noah's place with their Heads way up in the air. Another part of town, a woman woke up. She had a little poodle dog, about that long, about that high, more hair than dog. She picked it up off of a silk pillow by her pillow. Good morning, sweetheart. How is Mama's little darling this morning? You so sweet, give Mommy a kiss. And she kissed that little dog. And then she went to the back door and let him out into the backyard so that he could go out for his morning devotions. <clears throat> he started out across the backyard. Yip, 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 yip. And he got out there and out from behind a hedge, a big old lion stepped. He took one look at that little poodle dog, poodle burr all over the grass. And the lady ran back in. Oh, over in another part of town, a woman got up. Old wrinkled bathrobe on. Had her hair done up and antennas. 
tuned in on UHF channel 42. And with her old hair sticking up and her old wrinkled bathroom, she came to her front door to get her morning paper. And she opened the door and took one look out there. Ooh, and slammed the door and ran, called it, police, 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 there's a great big old hippopotamus right out in my front yard. What are you going to do about that a big old hippopotamus? Lady, we don't know what we can do. The whole town's full of strange animals. Just keep your door shut and don't go outside. We're trying to figure out what to do. Sure enough, all over that town, animals of all sorts, going down the streets and the alleys, all headed out toward Noah's place. And the people began to wonder, and it was on the television, on the radio, don't go out. We don't know about these animals. We don't know where they come from or why they're here. All we know is suddenly our whole city is infested with a lot of strange, dangerous animals. Two little old boys looking out a window, and they saw some big elephants coming, two big elephants. And they like to have a little closer look at those elephants, they thought. And they sneaked out the door while their mama and papa wasn't watching. And they standing on the sidewalk out there by the curb. You need two big old elephants coming. Vroom, 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 vroom. And they didn't pay any attention to those kids. And the kids were having fun watching those elephants and other animals. And they noticed it didn't bother the kids. And then the people began to go out there on the sidewalks watching those animals, all headed out toward Noah's place. One guy said to his neighbor, an old guy I know, he's not so dumb after all, is he? Yeah. He gone out here and trained these animals? I didn't know he was an animal trainer. He gonna have a circus. That's what he's gonna have out there, a circus. He'll get every dime that these kids can talk us out of. He'll sell cotton candy and balloons and things. He will get well financially off of that old ship and the circus that he's gonna have out there. And there was all kinds of conjectures and guesses about what was going on. In the meantime, Noah was out there at the ramp of the ark, and he had him a list here. He was checking off the animals as they came in. Seven pair of sheep run up there. Bip, bip, bip. Seven pair of doves flew over. And they took their place in the ark. And the old elephants coming up in there. And they came into the ark. And here came into the ark the big old giraffes. They had their head up, they came, and they dug away down. They went in into the ark. And the people began to gather out there. It was a thousand people. And then five thousand people. And then 10,000 people, and then acres and acres of people watching those animals come in. And Noah up there checking those animals off as they were coming in to the ramp. Two pigs. And he kept checking these animals off, checking them off. And that split got closer and closer and closer and closer. And then he saw what it was as the people in the front moved out of the way. Two little skunks with their tails in the air <laughs> came marching up. Take their place in the ark. And Noah kept checking them. After a while, his checklist was completed. And he stood in the door of the ark, looked at all that crowd out there. He said, now, people, I don't know exactly when the flood's going to come. It might come any day. God said that it wasn't going to come till the ark was finished. Now it's finished. But we still have room in the ark. And if there's anybody out there who wants to change your mind about the flood and about the judgment and about God and will come into the ark with us, we invite you to come in and be a part of those who will survive the flood. I'm going to ask my family to sing an invitation hymn. And while they sing, 
If you'd like to come into the ark, just step up the ramp and walk in. We'd be happy to have you. And he turned to his family, Ham and Sham and Japheth and their three wives. They were married then. Should have been 120 years. <laughs> and Mrs. Noah. And they began to sing, Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. And the people just looked at him like a hoot owl on a tombstone. Oh, some of them chewed bubble gum and blew a bubble. Some of them punched their neighbor and giggled. Some of them wrote a note and passed it down the line. But not a soul moved. And they sung the second stanza, and not a soul moved. And they finally came to the last stanza. And Noah said, now this is the last chance you're going to have to get an ark. While we sing it, will anybody come? And they sung it, finished. Not a soul had entered the ark. Noah and his family stepped back. And Noah said, I'm sorry. I wish somebody had to come. And as they stepped back, the ramp of that ark began to move up off the ground. And as it moved, it gained momentum, and finally, wham, it came together and sealed the side of that ark in a waterproof seal. And the people jumped, and they looked around, and nothing else was happening. After a while, they began to drift away, some to marry, some to be given in marriage, some to their sins, some to their licentiousness, some back to the sack, some to their vocations and their jobs and their problems, but not one to God. And they drifted away until after a while nobody was there, except a few people gathering up some souvenirs. And the day wore on, not a cloud in the sky. Oh, it was hot, and the people were glad my old sun went down below the western horizon and a little cool breeze kicked up and they had some relief from the heat and day two came. Over the eastern horizon, the sun rose like a great ball of fire. As it climbed to the zenith of the heavens, it got hotter and hotter and hotter until by noonday, the people were sweltering in the heat and they could find no relief anywhere. And they were so hot and miserable, some of them cursed whatever gods there might be that set such a fire in the sun. And when the old sun began to sink below the western horizon, they felt better. And a cool breeze stirred up and relieved them of the torture of the heat which they had endured during the day. And the third day came.